No, actually, this was a gift from an Australian named Ashley Hill. Uh, I, in back a couple of years ago, the World Science Fiction Convention was held in Melbourne, Australia, and I went to Melbourne and he put me up there. And then a little while afterwards, he came to the United States to see some space launches, and he stayed with me for a while, and then he moved on. And when he was in California at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, he bought this at the gift shop. It's actually a German product. Um, the uh, suspension area here is actually designed after the Voyager space probes. Um, but it's a little computer-controlled electromagnetic device that uh, carries the uh, in increases or decreases the magnetizing current depending on whether the uh, little moon globe is rising or falling. It's interesting that it's held up like by a magnet. Yes, there's a, there's a permanent magnet and an electromagnet, and the uh, there's a little computer controller, believe it or not, in the base here, which varies the current to the electromagnet based on what this sensor senses. So obviously this documentary is about the moon, and my first question is, when we have more kids, we dream about going to the moon. Our imaginations are, are so big that, you know, the sky's the limit. Um, when do you think we lose that wonder, that passion for exploration? I mean, obviously you didn't, but when do you think, like, the rest of, you know, society and why do you think that that happens? Well, a lot of people never do. I mean, if you notice, many of the people, including Elon Musk, who's here at South by Southwest, they were disappointed in the, in the 1970s or 80s, people who wanted to go into space, and they were told that they couldn't. You know, they were told the way you go into space is be an astronaut and go to the moon with NASA, and it discovered that uh, NASA wasn't flying to the moon, and that there were no vacancies in the astronaut program, and so they went and did something else. But they never gave up on that dream, and now that they've made piles of money doing something else, they're bringing that back and using that to fund their own space ventures, saying that, okay, well, if NASA's not going to fly me into space, then I'll do it myself. But many people, I think, just spend too much time believing what other people tell them is possible. The fact is, what's really possible, and this has been shown in serious academic studies, that educated people, you know, not peasants, not ignorant people, but educated people, throughout the world have a very strong tendency to set an unrealistically low probability on events which they simply don't expect. In other words, you expect to get up and drive to work and come back. You don't expect to be hit by a car and go into the hospital, but that's actually a fairly likely result. There's a lot of things that people put an abnormally low expectation value on compared to the probability of they're actually happening. And in the same way, there is a social repression of these ideas, and people go along with this idea, oh, it's not going to happen, or it's, it'll happen but not in my lifetime, or it's not something that I have to care about. The truth is that what the sort of thing I'm talking about is very, very likely if people will just believe in it. From a technical point of view, from an economic point of view even, I mean, people say, oh, well, you know, economics is unfavorable. Well, the fact is we're talking about a project which would cost a few billion dollars. A few billion dollars is less than what we spend marketing catch up in a year. In other words, we're not talking about a big effort. We're not talking about something that could only be done by the resources of a major national government or something of this kind. We're talking about something that could realistically be done by a reasonable size effort on the part of ordinary, uh, well, not exactly ordinary in the sense most people use the term, but ordinary people who care about this kind of thing. If there's a confidence that it'll really happen. And um, why do you think the government stopped, kind of halted that, you know, um, funding, ex further exploration and things like that? I mean, we just sent the satellites. We haven't sent, you know, more people and. Government doesn't have a compelling reason to do these kinds of things. In the 1950s and 60s, the United States was doing not just the space program, but other big, showy, difficult, expensive things. As President Kennedy said in his famous speech, if you actually listen all the way through it, big, showy, expensive things to show the world that America was a success and that it had money to burn uh, and that you should sign on with the Americans rather than the Soviets. 
Now, the thing is, the Moon Project was only one of many things, but at the same time, due, for example, to the Vietnam War and other things, the United States became kind of overextended, and in the Nixon administration, quite apart from President Nixon's own opinions, he was not exactly the biggest friend of this kind of thing, but quite apart from his own opinions, the U.S. was overextended, and it, a lot of people didn't see that this was an important thing, and so it was an easy thing to cut back on. Now, those of us who care about space have, because of the way it got started in the 50s and 60s, been waiting for the U.S. Congress, waiting for NASA, which is an executive agency of the U.S. government, and so on, to do these things for us. And if recent months have shown anything, it's that if you depend on Congress to do anything, even their jobs, you're going to be disappointed. I mean, the one thing that Congress legally has to do is pass a budget, and they aren't doing it. So from my point of view, those of us who really care about this have got to take up the work ourselves. And again, it's not a case of finding 5% of gross domestic product the way it was in the 60s. We're talking about a few cents here and there, to be really honest, a few cents here and there on the national income. It's not going to make any kind of hardship for anybody unless they choose it to do so. Uh, but people say, oh, this is going to be a huge government effort and it's going to sap all this funding that could otherwise go to such and such and such and such worthy cause. And I think we've seen from the way that our government works that uh, that's not a reasonable expectation, you know, that. Uh, if they're going to mess things up, they're going to find a way to do it no matter what their priorities are. It seems like even if they would do something, it would be far inferior than maybe like what, you know. Well, one thing that does happen is that when things go through that system, for example, right now there's a thing known as the Space Launch System, which is written into the NASA Authorization Act. It's known uh, to many of us in the community as the Senate Launch System. It's a rocket, but it wasn't designed by engineers. It was designed by senators to be sure that they keep the procurement contracts for the shuttle going. It has no purpose. It's supposedly intended to be involved in Moon and Mars missions and maybe an asteroid mission, but the intended launch rate is like one every two years, and it's not supposed to launch until like 2018. There's really literally nothing it can do. It's a pointless rocket that exists only to preserve certain jobs in certain congressional districts. And that is an example of why anybody, I mean, Dennis Tito is talking about going to Mars in 2018. Uh, I'm not a big fan of his mission model, but that shows you he's talking about actually going to Mars in the same year that NASA is talking about maybe doing an unmanned test launch of this next generation rocket, which looks amazingly like their last generation rocket and contains all the same parts and is worked on by all the same people. So there's an extent to which expecting government to do it, what you'll get is a version which doesn't do half the things you wanted it to do, comes five years late, and costs twice as much as you expected. Whereas if you go out and put club together, honestly, club together, put the money on the table and buy the necessary parts, even from the same suppliers who ordinarily sell to the government, you can genuinely accomplish the results you want to accomplish sooner and with less expenditure. So what do you think of like the Richard Bransons of, who are trying to put money into, into that? Um, do you think that their hearts are in the right place? Or? I think that the, the space tourism industry, the entrepreneurial space business which has started up is wonderful. Um, I would say it's kind of a few years later than I would have hoped for, obviously. And much of this would have been really wonderful 20 or 30 years ago, and now it's kind of, uh, it's still great, but it's kind of, gosh, this has been a long time coming. Um, the problem always has been, you could never buy a Saturn V, never buy a space shuttle. You could never buy a seat on the space shuttle, not really. Uh, there were a few companies that had government contracts that managed to get their people onto them, but you could never really buy a seat on the space shuttle. There's all of this kind of, um, all this kind of thing. Whereas, if NASA is buying from commercial contractors, if NASA is doing this kind of thing, 
than the rest of us can buy flights. The rest of us can buy launches. So com space tourism, commercial space, space entrepreneurism is a starting point for all of us who want to go into space without having to ask for permission. You know, Dennis Tito was the first U.S. space tourist to buy a seat on a Russian rocket and go up into uh, go up to the space station. He was denounced on the floor of the United States Senate on the grounds that if NASA didn't want to fly American civilians into space, then by God, they'd better not go. And that's exactly the wrong attitude if we really want to build a spacefaring, a cosmic civilization. So my last question, are you going to go? And you do yeah, you think you're gonna uh, you're gonna make it, or you, do you think that? I could be hit by a meteorite tomorrow or by an Austin City bus. Let's figure not. You know, I could be hit by a meteorite tomorrow by an Austin City bus, but honestly, I have a reasonable expectation that my efforts will lead to success. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing this. I would be doing something else. I'd be, you know, selling used cars or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I bet I could do it. Um, so to say, you know, what if this doesn't work out, to me, well, if it doesn't work out, the human race becomes extinct uh, when the next comet hits. Uh, you know, that's a dumb question to ask because the only answers to it are bad. The question to ask is, what if this does work out? What then? And the answer is, whatever you want. The entire universe, it's practically infinite. That means infinite opportunity. Thank you very much.